right, well, good morning and welcome to worship here at Bloomer United Methodist Church. How are you all doing this morning? Great. Good. Good. Well, it is gorgeous. It is a little chilly, but it is nice to see the sun. Um, you know, after last week, I don't know what it was like down here, but it wasn't overly nice with uh, sunshine and stuff. So it is glad, I'm glad to be back with you, and I want to thank you. Everyone who took time the last couple of weeks to help lead services while I was away, um, I do apologize for the poor PowerPoint background that you had that was difficult to see, um, so please forgive me for, for that, and so we're back to normal colors today for you. Uh, but let me begin with just a couple of quick announcements here in the life of our local church. Um, the first is that all shoes um, have to be in by October 9th. No more after that. All right? That's the way it shows up on my sheet, so that's the way I'll say it. All right? So Michelle's not going to pack up any more boxes of shoes if they come in after the 9th. You'll have to take them back home with you. Um, and then also... Um, we've created a closed closet work day next Sunday, October 10th, and there are two shifts available um, from 9 to 12 or from 12 until 3, and some of the duties will include sorting clothes, switching summer and winter stock, and putting out costumes. Um, Kim has a sign-up sheet for anyone that is interested, um, so she's back there waving it around, so please see her. Um, again, we're... It's Saturday. Oh, Saturday. Did I say that? Okay. So Saturday. It's the 10th. It's the 10th, but it's a Saturday. All right. Thank you for that. All right. So Saturday, October 10th. And again, we will be taking a special offering to support that mission. And so if you feel led to help out a local organization that does some great work and is in need of our help, um, we just invite you to, to participate in that for as long as you can because any help will be um, greatly appreciated. Um, also today, you should have received a World Communion Sunday offering um, envelope. This is one of our special offerings that we take at the United Methodist Church. I see Marianne has some back there if you're interested. And this goes to create scholarships for um, people around the world that are looking to do some amazing work. Um, so if you feel led to give to that today, regardless of the amount, I invite you to do that. And the offering plates are at both of the entrances this morning. Are there any other announcements that anyone would share this morning? Right. So again, folks, if you are joining us online, whether it is Facebook Live or our YouTube or um, Facebook or website, we welcome you. You're glad, we're glad that you stopped in for just a couple of seconds, minutes, or the whole time with us today. Whatever that is, we're happy to have you and look forward to worshiping with you. Uh, for those of you here, we just encourage you to continue to promote these um, social media and website uh, resources that we have to people so that we can continue to expand and spread our ministry and message to more and more people. So again, I invite you to check those out and interact with us as you feel led. Also, if you have any prayer requests, um, we would love to pray with you. We have a Tuesday morning prayer group, and we would love to lift up any joys or concerns that any of you may have and, and just be in prayer and journey with you in that special way. This morning, as we begin worship, I would like us to consider these centering words. They're very simple and yet very powerful. <clears throat> when we love God and our neighbors, everything changes. Would you pray this opening prayer with me this morning? God of love and judgment, when the Egyptians enslaved your people, your love set them free. When rulers oppress the poor and the powerless, your judgment brings peace and justice to the land. Reach our minds, O oh God, that we may fulfill your law of love. Touch our hearts, Holy that we may love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Amen. Also, one more quick announcement. If you are worshiping with us live uh, online this morning, 
We do have Holy Communion, and so I would just invite you to take a moment and prepare the elements so that you can join us if you choose to do that this morning. Oops. So if you would, if you would join us in our opening song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and the words will be on the screen.
you have. Cool. So what, do you remember what happened right there? What, what did we just watch? The Prince of Egypt? The Prince of Egypt? Yeah, we did. But the scene we just watched is, is when all of the plagues happened to the Egyptians, right? And why do the plagues happen? Because Pharaoh's heart is kind of hard and mean, right? And he's stubborn. And he says, Moses comes to the people and says, let my people go, because that's what God said. And Pharaoh says, no, I'm not going to let them go. I want them to keep working for me. And then all of those plagues happen to the people. And even though those plagues happen, Pharaoh still doesn't want to let his people go. So let me ask you a question. Do you ever get stubborn? <laughs> well, Cashin, even if you're not going to answer that, like I don't think any adults would like to answer that question either. So, But the point is that all of our hearts get kind of stubborn and hard sometimes. And we don't always listen to the things that God wants us to do. So that's why we need to spend some time in prayer each day to make sure that our hearts stay soft and that we keep listening to the things that God wants us to do so that we can treat other people the way God wants us to treat other people, okay? All right, well, let me pray for you guys, and then we'll continue with our service. So dear Lord, we just thank you for our, our young disciples this morning, and we just ask that you would continue to to just mold them and, and keep their hearts soft as they grow in faith and grow as, as boys and into young men. Lord, right now, just bless them as they go through their schooling and all of the things that they will do this fall. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are on week five of our series, um, Exodus, A Journey to Freedom. And so I just thought that I would do a brief recap for you. So if you have missed one of these weeks or if this is the first time that you're joining us or hearing um, part of this series and you hear something in one of the themes that you may be interested in going back and look at, I invite you to do that. Um, again, you can go to our YouTube page or we have a certain amount of sermon series or sermons on our website and you're, you're free to listen to those. So in the first week, we did our series intro and we, we talked a little bit about the context of the book of Exodus and what it meant and, and some of the um, organization of the very book itself. We also spent some time talking about slavery, and we talked about slavery in the ancient world. We talked about it in, in a form of transatlantic or American um, history, and we also talked about modern slavery um, and some of the trafficking in, in modern-day work slavery that goes on in our world today. And then we also began to touch on some of the themes of personal struggle and some of the things that come up in our lives that we can be slaves to or become enslaved by. Okay. In week two, we, our message was entitled Rumblings of Revolution, and we talked about the dangers of dark and evil orders. And if you remember that, um, Scripture dealt with the two midwives who refused to sacrifice or, or murder the young Israelite children, male children that were born. And we talked about how even ordinary people can sometimes become prone to these evil orders when they're constantly surrounded by it and the attempt to rationalize um, some of these orders or decisions that people make and what happens when we begin to dehumanize people and to see them as objects. Um, and then we looked at, in contrast, the rise of some of the abolitionists. And so we looked at those midwives in our Exodus story. We looked in terms of our American history. We looked at people like Harriet Tubman and Harriet Jacobs who uh, began to lead people to freedom who stood up against some of the systems of oppression and slavery in American history. And then we looked at a man um, named Tim Ballard who is, is an abolish, abolis, abolitionist um, in modern slavery and works to, to save children specifically from sex um, slavery. We talked about the idea of active faith and how God calls us to to, to just go in motion, to take sometimes just baby steps forward, and that that is a, 
a sign of our faith, and then we've talked about the need to confront evil when it presents itself. In week three, uh, you got to hear a recording called Leader Rising, part one, and we looked at the birth of Moses and sort of this um, unique story that happens with the birth of Moses. We looked at um, some of the characteristics of heroes that, that are common in literature and how we can see that in, in some of the story of Moses. And then we looked at how Moses returned to his roots, how he went to the land of Midian in order to get Egypt and some of these other things out of him and how he spent time in preparation, waiting and doing the things that God would call him to do, and how important it is for us to remember that there are periods in our life when we're called to preparation, and that doesn't mean we just sit around idly, but we prepare as best we're able to the, for the next thing that God calls us to do. And then finally, last week, um, we spent time talking about encountering God, and what it means to encounter God in our personal lives, what it means to have reverence for God, and how um, when we encounter God, we should, we should have this awe, this inspired reaction to those encounters. And then finally, we looked at Moses' call or commission, as well as our own call and what that means. And then we looked at, again, kind of what we may think as funny stories of how Moses begins to almost bargain with God back and forth, basically saying, who am I that you would choose me, and who are you that I can represent to the people you're calling me to? And then we left with the idea that, again, when we take that step forward, even amidst all the uncertainties that may arise, God will make a way. Now, today in week five also serves as sort of a transition for us in our series, uh, because Again, if you've been following with us, we've only gone through really the first four chapters um, in that series. And I told you I'd like this to get through chapter 20 by the end of this series. So you're thinking, well, gosh, we've got a long way to go if we're going to be working on half of a chapter or only a whole chapter at a time. But um, today we are really going to begin to spread things out. And we're going to look at um, chapters 5 through 11 and some of the themes that go on in there. So some of this can only be... Summary or summary for you, and so I invite you to spend time um, on your own going back and reading those scriptures. But let me get my Bible and I'll read to you the, those seven chapters, and then we'll begin our message. Okay, obviously. Some of you were like, "Yes, nap time." Others of you were like, "No." But I do think we have uh, what might be for some of us a difficult topic today. And so I've entitled this week um, message based off of Danielle Strickland's book, The Ultimate Exodus, that there's a Pharaoh in all of us. So I invite you to hear this opening reflection, which comes from um, a chapter in her book, and one that I think we, we really need to consider. So when we read the story of Exodus, why do we always assume that we have the most in common with the Israelites? What if we aren't the Israelites? What if we are the Egyptians? We would do well to consider that possibility, and I think that is a very insightful yet difficult thing for us to do, because of course we like to think that we're the underdogs in these situations and that we're always the one doing God's will and that, you know, there's these big bad things out there that try to prevent us from doing that. But in reality, I think if we would use a little bit of scrutiny on our lives, we might find that we have a fair amount in common with the Pharaoh and the Egyptians. So I'm going to begin in chapter 5, and we're going to look at the first couple of verses here. And it says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went off to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Now, from the, the text perspective, it's pretty interesting that 
Moses and Aaron come with this bold proclamation, sort of this prophetic proclamation that says, let my people go, because this is what God has called us to do. And we need to remember that they are speaking to the Pharaoh, the highest ruler in the land, someone who thought himself divine, that he himself was a god and someone who in many ways also worshipped or was part of a pantheon of other very powerful Egyptian deities. And so it's interesting that Moses and Aaron come forth boldly and make this proclamation before this powerful man. But then it's also telling the Pharaoh's heart that he basically says, well, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Why should I let Israel go? Again, he thinks he, he's a god. And he's probably saying, well, why would I let the god of slaves go? Obviously, this god isn't very powerful if all these people are my slaves and I've been ruling over them for hundreds of years. Why should I let them go? And so almost from the onset here, we see this attitude, almost this arrogance, if you will, like in, or arrogance or confidence in Pharaoh as he approaches this. Now, as I sat and contemplated this text for a little bit, I also wondered, does Pharaoh truly not know who the God of the Hebrews or the Israelites is? I mean, these people have been in Egypt for how many hundreds of years? Is it that he just failed to listen or care? Which could be. Or is it because the people themselves haven't actually been the representatives of God the way they were called and designed to be? And again, we can't answer that directly from the text, but I think they're interesting things for us to contemplate as we go forward and as we look at our own lives and say, are we truly representatives of God? When people see us and they hear the things that we say and they see and witness the things that we do, do they truly see the God that we serve? Do we openly talk about our encounters with God in our life and our faith or when matters of religion and belief come up, we just remain silent. At the same time, I think we also have to consider again with our theme of a Pharaoh and all of us, where do we get stubborn and take on an error and arrogance about us when it comes to God? How many times do we like to just do things our own way? I can't count how many times in my own life Josh's ways seem better than God's way. Oh, I can do this, no problem, God. I got this one all by myself. And in some ways, we might also say that we raise ourselves to the level of being our own gods when we do that. And so, might we too say, who is this God that I should obey him? I kind of like being able to set my own rules and doing the, own, the things that I like to do. So again, Moses and Aaron make another proclamation to, to the Pharaoh. And in verse 4, <clears throat> it says, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. And so now we see a transition already as Pharaoh moves from just sort of this what you might say, contemplative view of just who is God to all of a sudden beginning to move into a protectiveness of his kingdom. And I have kingdom in quotations there because, again, he's not only protecting his actual civilization, but is he protecting his own personal kingdom, the things that gives him his power, his influence. <clears throat> And so again, he, we continue to see the oppression of the Hebrew or Israelite people. Again, as he says, look, these people have grown a lot. They're numerous. And if you take them from me or if I let them leave, how much productivity, how much wealth, how much power will I lose by letting them go? 
My question for you is, how much do we try to protect the kingdoms that we've built? Our own personal kingdoms. Now, many of us, I think, if we do any <coughs> cursory glance at our lives, we'll find that in some ways we've created little kingdoms. We've created little spaces that we feel very comfortable. We've created lifestyles that match our desires and needs and wants. And we don't like it when people or things begin to pick at that and make us feel uncomfortable. The most obvious example of this has just been the, the COVID epidemic that we've gone through. It's shaken many of the lifestyles we have. We're not able to do the things that we're accustomed to doing. Some of us may have found our jobs and livelihoods threatened. Some of us may have had to deal with loved ones getting sick or even passing away. And we begin to get protected. And perhaps rightly so on some things, but sometimes they go too far. And sometimes when, especially when it comes to our own desires, we can move into a state of denial about these things and not really pay attention to some of the harm that we may end up doing as we try to protect those. As we move into denial of some of the things that we do, some of the things that we say, some of the sins that we commit, we immediately begin to grasp for more power, for more control. Kind of think of it as a hand, and as that hand, or as we try to constrict that hand, trying to control more and more, refusing to let that go, because this is what we've created, and we are entitled to this, and these are the things that we deserve, and the tighter we grasp, and pretty soon stuff begins to squeeze through our fingers because we're gripping so tight. So let's move forward just a little bit. Now many of you, if you've been in church for a while, know the next part of the story. And it's a major part of chapter 5. And basically what we see here is the complete systemization of oppression that the Egyptians have in place. And so Pharaoh says, look, you want to play games? Then let's play games. Not only do you have so, much, so many bricks that you need to make per day, but now you get to make those bricks without straw, or you have to go get the straw yourself, but still keep the same quota. And so he goes to his taskmasters, and the taskmasters go to the foremans, and the foremans who actually happen to be Hebrew people. And this work continues. Well, obviously, it's all great for the person at the top who doesn't have to do any of the labor, but um, I'm not an expert brick maker by any means, but when you're making brick out of mud or clay and you're using that straw to bind it together and hold things together, it becomes much more difficult when you don't have it. And it becomes much more difficult to keep your quota up if you have to go get the straw yourself. And so, again, scholars have noted how there's just this complete system and how sometimes only the elite really are mentioned in, this, in these passages of Scripture because, again, you're dealing with Moses and Aaron, you're dealing with Pharaoh, you're dealing with the taskmasters, and you're dealing with the foreman. But not a word from the common people, the people who are bearing the brunt of the slavery and oppression. And their silence, in many ways, screams out. So one thing I would like us to consider then is where do the poorest of poor scream out? Do we hear the silence of many of the victims that are oppressed and in slavery today? And are we the taskmasters, the foremen? Now it doesn't take long, and, and again at the end of Chapter 4, we saw Aaron and Moses come before the, the Israelite people and say, you know what, these are the signs that God has given us and God wants to lead you out. And they say, yep, this is great. We've seen these supernatural signs and we're ready to go. And now, when the first confrontation between Pharaoh and Moses, things get worse. And it doesn't take very long for the Hebrew foreman to come back and say, look, Moses and Aaron, you just made life a living hell for us. The Pharaoh's demanding even more work from us, and we can't do it. Why would you do this? And again, an interesting tactic of, of slavery and oppression is that the oppressor will sometimes create um, division even amongst the people. 
And so you have Hebrew, Hebrews oppressing Hebrews. And then, of course, Moses and Aaron can't take the blame. And so they immediately go right back to God and say, you know what, God? I don't know what you're doing, but you just created a whole bunch of problems for these people. And ever since we went to Pharaoh, you and him kind of seem to be in league, and you just created basically a bunch of evil for these people. And so in many ways, I think we could almost translate that word trouble into evil. And so think about that comment of Moses saying that to God. Again, questioning, look God, you told me this, but you've really done this to the people. But how often in our own lives do we fail to take personal responsibility for the things that we say, for the actions that we do? Our culture is rife with not wanting to accept consequences for actions. We love to blame it on other people, on institutions, on classes of people. Oh, I can't believe these retailers have made millions and billions in this pandemic at the expense of these people. They're so bad. It's not my fault. I can't get ahead. It's their fault. And you can go on and on with numerous examples from just about every sphere that we live in. But folks, there comes a time if we're truly going to be serious about doing stuff that we need to take personal responsibility for our own actions and realize that we are the ones in charge of those things. No one makes us say things. No one makes us act certain ways. We make those decisions ourselves. Now I'm going to do verse six in, or chapter 6 in a basic summary. And, and really what we have here is the first... Three quarters of chapter six is really a repeated commission story of mm -hmm. Moses with his objections. Again, God coming to Moses saying, look, this is who I am. This is what I want you to do. Moses again says, look, God, I don't know if I'm qualified. I'm a man of uncircumcised lips. He gives the objections and God says, look, this is what I will do. The last part of that chapter deals with the genealogy, which is everybody's favorite topic in biblical context, uh, but besides the long list of names, the genealogy serves the purpose of being a credential for Moses, but especially Aaron, and that lineage that they show traces them to the tribe of Levi, and the tribe of Levi will become the priestly tribe, and that's important for the prophetic status and priestly status that both Aaron and Moses have. Now I want to conclude today with Again, going almost back to the video that we watched, and I want to talk about the plagues in hard hearts, okay? Now, the plagues in some way, I think, in our modern understanding are very difficult for us to grasp why God would use these certain things. And of course, scholars over the years have come up with any number of interpretations for what the plagues are, what they present, or represent, how they're organized, you know, some people will keep it very simple and say, well, the plagues just increase in severity. Others have done five groups of two, or they've looked at the specific settings. And folks, I would invite you, I think this is a really interesting area that we can look at, but probably something more devoted to a Bible study. So I would leave you, as you consider the plagues today, to think about the idea of order and creation versus chaos and uncreation. So for the Israelite people, our God is a God of creation. He's a God of order. He's put everything in place. God sustains everything by his power. He's a God of order. Now, Egypt in this story become, comes to represent an element of chaos and this idea of uncreation that, look, the Egyptians are no, no longer following this order that God has given, and as a result, they begin to see their civilization almost uncreated by some of the plagues that come about and some of the chaos that they represent. Now, the other major issue with the plague, and one that we, we struggle to deal with, is this idea of hardening of hearts. 
And many of us question this idea of what it means for Pharaoh's heart to be hardened. Because in the scriptures, there's a number of times where it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let the people go. And there's a number of verses that says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let the people go. And so we're kind of left with, what does it mean if both Pharaoh and God are doing that? And again, there's been two major kind of streams, and unfortunately they've been at the extremes. And one sees... You know, God is completely sovereign and that everything that happens in these plague stories is completely determined by God. And so really, Pharaoh has no free will to make any of his own decisions and his heart is just hardened by God and God says, look, I'm going to basically break this man until he lets my people go. And then again, on the other extreme, you have people who only look at the free will of Pharaoh saying, you know what, this is completely Pharaoh's choice. He's choosing on his own free will every time not to let the people go. And I think I would move to a middle position that says it's a little bit of both. That obviously God has an influence, but Pharaoh also has his own free will. And those sometimes interact and sometimes are in disunity. I also think our understanding of hardening of hearts, when we think of that or we hear it, we often think of it just as a, a shut-off valve. Like, it's either on or off. Okay? Oh, his heart was hard and just boom, it's off. It's just, he's done. But I don't think that's what it's like. I see it almost as like a shell being around your heart. And every time an influence comes up and says, you know what, let my people go, he has to think about it. And he says no. And his heart gets another casing around it. Well, again, after two or three layers of that casing, it gets harder and harder to penetrate <laughs> that hardened state. So folks, what about our hearts? Do we have hard hearts? Do we harm other people trying to keep our kingdoms intact? I want to read to you a chapter or a couple of paragraphs um, from Daniel Strickland's book, The Ultimate Exodus. And I have to say, this was very difficult for me to read and to begin to think about, but I invite you to listen to this. She says, as much as I want to identify with the Israelites, it would be its own subtle form of denial to suggest that that's the only way the Exodus story applies. The truth is much different. Right now, our entire Western economy thrives still at the expense of the poorest of the poor. Women and children in India and Bangladesh, far removed from our view, toil in cotton fields, often unpaid as slaves so I can buy a t-shirt for $5. That purchase saves me enough cash to buy a cheap cup of coffee by farmers in Ethiopia or Papua New Guinea who were ripped off by someone whose name and company I don't care to know. Because I don't care because I care more about because I care about more than people who can afford to feed their family is that I have a chocolate donut with my coffee. And don't even get me started about cocoa that made that donut. Picked by children enslaved on cocoa plantations on the Ivory Coast of Africa. Most of those child slaves have been trafficked from Mali because they are extremely poor and vulnerable to the worst forms of oppression. But who really cares because nothing goes better together than chocolate and coffee. So slavery is stitched into my clothes and cooked into the food and drink, cooked into my food and drink. And I forgot to mention it on the brochure of my hard-hearted life. So friends, again, it's been difficult as I have gone through this to think about some of those things. And I have to say that there's part of me that, that has been sinful, that has just completely put that out of my mind because why think about that when I can just continue to live in the kingdom I've created? Now, I don't have immediate solutions for how we begin to solve all of that. I mean, maybe we begin to advocate for products that are not manufactured in those type of ways. And so we have to do sort of an ethical type of shopping. Maybe we don't support companies that engage in those type of business practices so we don't make investments 
those enterprises. But again, I think if many of us would look, we would find more than we would like that our hearts are hard to many of these issues. How many of you over the past four weeks have honestly gone back and looked at some of the themes that I've talked about, especially with regards to slavery or some of the historical black marks that we have in our history? Or have you just breezed that over and say, yeah, that's, it's there, but it's not a big deal. And so folks, we have to wrestle with the idea of being complicit in some of these things. And so I invite you to wrestle with that this week. Finally, I would give you one final quote, and this comes from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who is a Nobel Prize winner, um, a Russian writer, who lived through the gulag system in the Soviet Union. And he says this, Gradually it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart, and through all human hearts. This line shifts inside us, it oscillates with the years. And even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained. And even in the best of all hearts, there remains an unuprooted small corner of evil. And so folks, again, you've heard me talk many times about the importance of taking a look, a deep look, at the state of our hearts. The entire Sermon on the Mount when Jesus talked was all about the state of our hearts. And so let us heed the wisdom and let us pray for soft hearts hearts that truly long and seek after God, but also hearts that would love our neighbors, all of our neighbors, as we love ourselves. So some action steps for you this morning. Spend time in prayer and reflection and examine the kingdom that you have created. To what lengths do you go to protect it and keep it productive? What is the state of your heart? Around which things and people do you heart them? What steps can you take to begin to open the doors of your heart and hear the cries of those in need? I would encourage you to spend time reading through chapters 5 through 11 because, again, we just did a very quick glance at much of those. And also continue studying and exploring the, the entire book of Exodus. And finally, friends, continue to be in steadfast and continual prayer um, for many of the, the issues that are going on in our land, prayers for individuals as well as intercession on behalf of many people and things that are occurring. All right, God bless. At this time, I would invite you to lift up and share any joys or concerns that may be on your hearts this morning. Prayers for Clayton. I would like prayers for um, he used to live with us because he's six five and he has uh, had a lot of the pain and that's where he's going to live from now on. And he, don't, he can't talk or nothing. And he's whole. That's where they want him. So prayers for a, a man. Lenny Sturt. What is it? Lenny Sturt. So prayers for Lenny as he battles some major health challenges. Is there another hand I saw? Or prayers for my brother who was going to have surgery in a His name is Keith. Keith? Was it Keith Bart? Keith. Keith? Okay. So prayers for Keith as he has surgery tomorrow. Anything else this morning? Prayers for our president and first lady.
we have prayers for Kim's daughter with ankle surgery, and then also May's sister Darlene, who is battling cancer. All right, let us take <clears throat> these things and anything else that may be on your heart in the moment of silent prayer this morning. <clears throat> Dear gracious God, we come to you and we thank you for this moment, this morning, for this chance to worship you and praise you and glorify you through this service. Lord, I pray that you would help each of us search the depths of our hearts, to be discerning of your call on our lives and to live the lives that are worthy of your, your name and that calling. Lord, right now you have heard this list of requests. And so we lift up to you Clayton and Lenny and Keith, our president and first lady, for Kim's daughter and for May's sister. Lord, we just ask that you would do your mighty and powerful work in each and every one of those situations. Lord, where there is healing requested that that may be provided where there is prayers for comfort and peace, we pray for that as well. Lord, be with each of those people that are on this list and also for those that are not present or have unspoken requests. Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers and that you answer those prayers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us when we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us continue now with our great thanksgiving. Dale, can I have you slide through this for me? So the Lord be with you. And also with you. 
Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all of the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving, as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father... Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. <clears throat> the body of Christ given for you. As you finish up, I invite you to prepare to sing our closing song, Standing on the Promises.
now to serve the living God, whose image we bear. May all our work be done with faith. May all our efforts be filled with love. Go and persevere with the hope that comes through Jesus Christ. God bless. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next. Amen. Amen.